Welcome to this afternoon's seminar on uh, using data to tackle crime, policing in South Africa and Bavaria. We are very happy today to have uh, two senior ranking police officials from the Bavarian State Police. They're in South Africa for a week um, and they have made their time available this afternoon to provide us with some insights into how the Bavarian police use data. This is significant because Munich is one of the which is the capital of Bavaria, is one of the safest cities, and Bavaria is one of the safest provinces in Europe. Um, and their police, policing approach is well known and well respected. And so we thought it'd be a good idea to get them today to provide us with some insights about what they do. And then we're very fortunate enough to have members of the South African Police Service who are also involved in policing and using data. Um, and so we'll really kind of talk a bit about how the different agencies use police data, uh, and what its utility for policing is. Um, before I get to introducing the speakers, I just want to thank the Hans Seidel Foundation, who are the sponsor of this event. They are a generous funder of the Institute for Security Studies for many years now, um, and fund most of our work on crime and violence and policing in South Africa. Um, for those that are not aware, the ISS is a pan-African organization. We also have offices in Kenya and Ethiopia and Senegal and our head office is in Pretoria. And we're glad to be able to be here this morning or this afternoon in Cape Town. And of course, this is the day the crime stats were released. We weren't planning that, it just sort of happened. So talking about police and police data, um, it's quite apt. So we'll, we'll, we'll get a bit more insights into this. We will start with um, presentations from the South African Police Service, and then I'll hand over to our Bavarian colleagues before we will then have a, a situation where you can ask questions and make comments about what you've heard. The seminar is also being recorded so that we'll be able to put it on vid YouTube. So if seeing it once isn't enough for you, you can get onto YouTube and watch it again. But mainly we did receive a lot of requests from various people across the country and in fact as far as Uganda from police officers there wanting to know if they could stream in. Um, and so we've made that, uh, that technology available. So without further ado, I have spoken up, and then we'll end with Andrew Four, sorry, Dr. Andrew Four, uh, who is a consultant at the ISS um, and has done work on policing for uh, at least a decade or so in South Africa. So can I please ask um, Brigadier Fossler, Colonel Fossler, to come to the podium. He's from the South African Police Service Crime Stats Registrar. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As I've been browsing through the audience uh, leading up to everybody get settled, I did see a few uh, familiar faces that I worked with through my uh, six years while I was in Kailicha, um, specifically the lady from VPUU. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to share with you in terms of um, what does the African police do when it comes to the, the, the crime process or the analysis of crime. And unfortunately or fortunately, as the previous speaker indicated, that is the day that our crime stats was released for the 2017, 18 years. So I'm not sure whether I'm the right person to be standing in front of you because it doesn't make for good reading. So uh, unfortunately, but that is the way that the cookie crumbles and hopefully we can learn from, from those things and improve. So just from my side, I will very briefly run through you to the, through the processes of how we and the South African police go about in analyzing crime. Um, at the end of the day to get to a specific product that it can be used to operationalize what we've gained from data from various sources and systems and then obviously uh, like I said once it's operationalized then put it into 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 uh, to the to the people that must actually execute the work that comes from there now obviously from uh, our side we we use a number of systems to, to, to access data or to, to get to data. One of our primary systems is our uh, CAS, uh, the Crime Administration System. It's a computerized system that we have in terms of registering and capturing uh, data on. We also have our Crime Management Information System, which is specifically in our language called the SAP6, which is the system that almost like a scoreboard in terms of how crime are being dealt with. Um, then we've got the CRIM system, which is a criminal record system in terms of certain uh, profiling and stuff that we use from there. We've also got the global access system um, from where we also source data. And then um, within the global access system, there's, there's subsystems, there's the, the BI or op operational analysis system. We've got our geographical, geographical information system, which is our crime mapping. And then we also got profiling. 
Now, the, the, in, in terms of the global access control system, the GAG, as we call it, the GAGS, that is a system that actually draws a lot of stuff from our official crime administration system. Apart from the systems that we have, that we are using to, uh, to, to access uh, data and information, we also have the visiting of crime scenes, we do have what we call field visits, we do environmental assessments, um, docket analysis in terms of matrices, to, to, and we'll get to that in the presentation. We interview suspects and we also interview witnesses. So those are all sources in terms of us getting information and having access to information and data at the end of the day to, uh, to get a formalized product. I hope everybody can see here. I know it's fairly small, but it seems to me from where I'm standing, it's, it's relatively okay. Um, in terms of the action analysis of crime, um, in the South African police, we've got three policing levels. We've got the local level where the tacky eats the tar, which is the station level. And we've got the cluster level, which is uh, almost like an extension from the top one, which is the provincial level, apart from national, of course. Um, at cluster level, there's normally a cluster commander that is in charge of a, of a number of police stations that is situated within a geographical area. And then, of course, um, our provincial level and then uh, the national level. In terms of the provincial level, there's certain roles and responsibilities in terms of the analysis, analysis capacity. Um, we have the uh, intelligence analysis center, which is situated within the uh, crime prevention uh, component. Then we've got the, the provincial crime registrar. Those are the people that is the custodians of the crime stats on provincial level. And then also at um, uh, the provincial um, operational coordinating center, our friends, was, uh, we hosted them yesterday and we took them through our, our operational coordination center that is in, uh, in, in Long Market Street in terms of how things actually materialize while there's operations and the whole coordination between the various units. Also from there, and then we've got a new component that we're busy with, which I'm also heading, is the, called the, the monitoring and evaluation, where we also, um, after operations, uh, uh, monitor, look at things, how we can improve, learn from it, because we found that one of the areas that we are lacking is in terms of monitoring, because we need to learn from what has went wrong and learn from those things that is working and try and, and build it into something new that can take us forward. Then on the cluster level, like I said, which is the level just beneath, beneath the province, there we've got the, uh, the intelligence analysis center. They also fall within the, uh, the broader crime intelligence environment. And then at station level, we've got a, a, an office that we call the Crime Information Management and Analysis Center. In police terms, we call it CIMAC. They are the person that's working at ground level um, in, at the end of the day in, in formulating products for the people to execute uh, whatever needs to be executed. Just in terms of a, a product or a process flow, you will see here that if you look at the crime um, threat analysis process, we've got the uh, statistical analysis, which is part of, we've got the geographical analysis as the second step, we've got the crime pattern analysis. Um, we also get step four in terms of the, the linkage of crime. Um, the step five is the case docket analysis. Then we've got the field work, and then we, go, then we get profiling. And at the end of the day, we have an output which is identified and variable crime uh, series that we can use. Now, my presentation will be mostly based, based in terms of these steps that I've highlighted. So I'll just go through the process, how, how we, we take things, and then we will we'll see how it goes from there. If we look at the crime um, pattern analysis, um, at the station, then we need to look at a few products that we are using. And first and fo foremost is the product is the, the, the crime priorities and threats. Now at station level, there's functions that needs to be conducted, which is to, to reach the consensus of the, of the crime priorities by all environments in the station. And from there on, the purpose is to determine the crime categories that should be prioritized by the station at the end of the day to, to operationalize. Now, what we need to do there is we need to get an an overview of the extent of the crime, where the increasing trends is, the perceived concerns of fear or the outcry of the community, and also the financial losses and or economic impact of the crime and the social impact, which in terms of uh, that is um, taken, was taken up in the National De Development Plan. Now, in terms of um, this specific product, uh, at the bottom I've inserted a, 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 just a portion in terms of the headings that the product looks like, which is the, the station's crime priority and threats, where you will have the priority in terms of the contact crimes, the priority in terms of the property crimes and the threats. Those are the two main crime categories that we work with, contact crimes being those that you can feel onto your body, property crimes obviously 
self-explanatory. And then there's also certain threats that has an impact on those two broader crime, crime cat categories. If you want to look at the crime pattern analysis findings, <clears throat> there you need to look at the analysis of the what, the when, the how aspect of crime. Those are we call the four whiskeys in the hotel in terms of asking those questions because we need to learn from that. And that is to provide crime intelligence units, uh, crime prevention units rather, which is the people that is supposed to do the work on the ground uh, with uh, crime information to assist in the deployment of resources rather spe on specific days of the week, specific times of the day, etc., etc. And we will come to that later in the presentation. Once again, we have a specific product that we use that we uh, tabulate all the information on that gets used in the final planning process. Uh, once again, you'll look at the count of the offenses, the day of the week. We'll also have the time when it happens at the end of the day for us to be able to deploy our people at the right times, at the right places, not waste uh, valuable resources in times that is less prone to crime than others. Um, the further one that we use is the modus operandi analysis, very important because crimes in terms of, or in terms of certain crimes, there's modus operandi, and that's a Latin word for how things are being done. You might find people that hijack, they use a specific area, a geographical area, or they go out for a specific vehicle. They, when they hijack people, they utter specific words, or their threat is of a specific way. That, that becomes modus operandi. So when you do analysis, and you start doing your docket analysis, you also look at those things to say, but this few dockets or this 10 hijackings in this specific station area can be of the same people and, 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 and so forth. So that is in terms of the, the modus operandi analysis that we, that we do. The next, next one is when you come to our repeat and our group offenders. A lot of uh, offenders in our area, in, in the province, is what we call repeat offenders. Um, you will find if you sometimes arrest them, and you check their profile, they have been previously in, uh, uh, um, in direct conflict, uh, conflict with the law. They might have previous cases. Some of them might have been out on bail. Some of them has been, uh, uh, might be wanted. Fingerprints were found on, on specific scenes, but they were never arrested for that. So we look in terms of the, 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 um, the group offenders. And once again, they, it's linking of dockets. So if we have a specific person, he's a housebreaker, and we find him, we arrest him, and we go to our systems and we, we, we put these fingerprints through the system, it might come up that that person's fingerprints was found on a quite a number of housebreakings. So at the end of the day, in terms of the justice system, it would be much better to send that guy to court with 10 cases where his fingerprints was found than just to send him to court with one. Because it comes about sentencing and the seriousness of the offense, habitual repeat offenders are those. That needs to be, the, con the, the, the investigator needs to convince the magistrate that this is an habitual offender, or as we call it, a repeat offender, which at the end of the day might an influence on how the, 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 the trial might go. Once again, we also have a, a, um, a specific document that we look at um, how we um, tabulate those things, and um, it becomes part of the products that, that are being used by the South African Police Services. Then the most wanted offender, some of you have, might have heard the word wanted. In the old days, there was a program on the, on the, on the TV called Police File. I'm not sure it's still on. Um, I don't have a lot of time to watch TV. But um, once again, we also work with, with the most wanted. So even at the provincial level, there's people that we call on the most wanted list. Those are mostly people that is sought for a, a range of serious offenses in the in the category of murder, hijackings, house robberies, business robberies, those serious things. And so at station level, there's also, and even at cluster level, so we need to look at um, the examples and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the, these um, most wanted offenders that also help us at the end of the day. We have two approaches that we currently follow in the South African Police Services, specifically in the Western Cape, and that is called the geographical approach, where we have to find out where is things happening. But once you have highlighted, say for instance, the geographical area is this street block that we are within the where we are today. This is a street block. We find out that there's a lot of robberies happening, for instance. That is the geographical area. And then we need to find out, but who is responsible for the robberies in that area? And then we talk about the targeted approach. Who is the target? Is it a specific grouping? Is it an individual? Is it a gang? Um, is it a kingpin in terms of the gang bosses that lets his, let, let these people walk here and sell you drugs or that sends these uh, runners out to rob people? So those are the two uh, main areas that we're using in terms of the analysis um, and getting to the, the specific uh, strategy when, de when deploying. Uh, the other thing that we also need to take into consideration is uh, what we call the verified drug posts or as we call it drug outlets. 
very important to have an indication of that in your area because normally within the gang environment, in the Cape Flats area, those of you that are familiar with Cape Town will, will know that we are sitting with, with the gangs and the drugs in the Cape Flats area and we also need to have an understanding of where these gang, uh, these um, drug posts and outlets are and that also needs to be taken into consideration at the end of the day into a product that we have to plan in and around that because sometimes a specific dwelling is is the, the, the area from where they operate and in and around those areas it might be a drug, gang stronghold and from there they then conduct their, their various business, either the drug running but also having their people robbing citizens walking through those specific um, turf areas of theirs. The another one that we need to look at is our unlicensed and problematic premises. Once again, that is also taken into, into consideration. We have in the province quite a large number of of uh, illegal drug uh, liquor outlets um, from where a lot of things happen and which has an influence in terms of the geographical uh, approach when it comes to, uh, to crime prevention and to policing. And we need to be aware of what's happening there. And that there also goes a specific emphasis into dealing with those, uh, with those premises in terms of them because liquor, liquor is one of the four um, generators of crime that is identified in the province. We've got um, liquor as the one, we've got drugs, we've got firearms, and then the third one is what we call the persons of interest. Those are your wanted suspects, people that are repeat offenders, people that has been circulated as wanted, um, people's fingerprints that was found on scenes, etc., etc. So those are the four uh, um, um, generators. So in terms of also analyzing, that needs to be taken into consideration. We need to understand where it is and the specific ways of dealing with um, these um, pro problematic licensed premises. Then another one, I've mentioned um, firearms as a, as, a, as a generator of crime. Once again, we also need to have to our disposal um, documents and products in terms of how we deal with problematic and second-hand good dealers. Once again, firearms on its own, we understand the, the, the influence of firearms, but also second-hand dealers is the market sometimes where the stolen property and the robbed and hide property go to. So once again, there we are in a position to identify these areas and uh, this, uh, the, the, the geographical areas where these things are happening, the specific addresses where the second-hand uh, dealers are, and we obviously have to police them in terms of specific um, um, uh, legislation. Once again, there we also have a, a matrix analysis document that we then populate, which assists uh, the, the decision makers at station level then to, to plan operations. Another one that is a problematic for us within certain areas is the chop shops. That is a term for people that is selling car parts, stolen hijacked vehicles goes to these specific areas, this backyard mechanics, the vehicle gets stripped within a couple of hours, then they sell the doors, they sell the engine parts, etc., etc. Once again, also a market for stolen or hijacked vehicles. We also need to be in a position to, uh, to focus on, on these illegal scrapyards. And sometimes we also get people that sell that stuff to the legal scrapyards so that we have to be in a position to, to, to deal with them. Then, if you look at threats, um, we also need to be in a position to provide operational units with threats. Um, and once again, in terms of the threats, we refer to those unique crime threats limited to the certain geographical areas, which are not necessarily covered by the normal crime statistics of a, of a station area, um, such as abalone smuggling, drugs um, in schools, drug labs, rhino poaching, all these things that you hear in the, in the news. Those are all threats towards... Um, um, the, the broader crime in, in, in our country and obviously for that matter also in the, in the Western Cape. Um, copper ca ca cable theft, I'm sure you've all heard in the news the last couple of months in terms of the, our trains and our infrastructure that has been sabotaged by these people. We are very fortunate at this stage that there's new legislation that allows us now, if we arrest a guy for in possession of uh, cable coupled copper, for instance, that is coming from the rail environment or from this... Um, uh, Vodacom and those towers, it is, it is now being seen almost as, a, or not being seen in terms of that uh, um, amendment act of the criminal procedure. It is now not, if you own, you're not being charged only for being possession of the actual cable or for damaging it in terms of uh, damage to property, but it's almost like sabotage to the state because of the, 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 the downtime of infrastructure in terms of trains, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, which then gives it also a very high priority in court and in terms of sentencing. A person can be sent, it's quite, uh, more, quite harsher in terms of when a person is found guilty in that. 
Then early warning information, another source of information that we need to use, where we look at events that can happen um, that has an impact on crime, on the policing. Um, sometimes we get information on a, on a very early stage, and then also we need to understand and have people that can analyze that at the end of the day to give us information so that we can try and proactively deal with, with an early, uh, um, early warning information. Um, then we've got parolee information, also a source for us. Um, one of the areas that we're also struggling sometimes, regularly people are being, are being um, let out on parole on a regular basis. Those people come back into the communities and it needs, needs to be phased back into communities. And there's a lot of programs by various departments, but also when it comes to crime again, there is a big portion of these people that become, uh, just go back into the system again. And that it's important for us to be able to have that to our disposal so that we can have proactive um, knowledge of it so that we can also plan for them. If we know a lot of parolees or a parolee that stays in a certain street as is a housebreaker or a robber and that person comes back into the community, he gives up an address of his uncle or his aunt, then we need to know about it because that is important for us. Suddenly you see upskirts of that specific crime in that area. It might be the link to the person that was, that was released on parole. So once again, also in terms of that, we are taking that into consideration in terms of planning. Then OCTA, that is uh, Organized Crime Threat Analysis. Uh, that is what the word OCTA stands for. Once again, <clears throat> here we look at organized crime where there's a group or a grouping that is responsible. Like, for instance, this rhino poaching is seen as organized crime because there's also um, money involved and, and those type of things. It's, it's big. It's a, almost like an organization type on its own. And once again, there we need to look at uh, the linkages and the matrix analysis in terms of, uh, of, uh, um, of those crimes. Uh, they are normally seen as a group of two or more people that is involved in specifically serious crimes. Um, and it's a, over a prolonged period and the financial gains in power. Those people become very, very um, uh, active. Then in terms of dealing with this, we also make use of the, of the POCA Act, the Prevention of Organized Crime Act. That gives us also in terms of with us, with the MPA, more powers in dealing with them. And in terms of their sentencing and the way that they are being charged, not only for, for instance, for murder, but if it's within the organized crime environment, then that those other charges will be added and it makes it just, just, just so much more um, serious. And at the end of the day, it can have influence on the term and the type of sentencing that will be handed out by the, by the magistrates. Then um, another product that we need or that we use in terms of um, our analysis is our station intelligence profile. That is a document that, it, that gives us an overview of a police station. How many bus stops is there? How many taxi ranks is there? Um, where's the hotspots? What's happening at the hotspots? Um, it almost like a, a, a holistic uh, overview of a, a police station because so if you have one police station or a police station with one taxi rank and suddenly there's a new, two new taxi ranks opening, it will have an influence on crime in the area. I was for more than eight years the station commander of, of Tableview on the, on the west coast and um, I was there during the time that the My City bus service uh, was introduced and a very, very, very good and user-friendly service for the community, but it was an upskirts in terms of our robberies because suddenly people parked their cars, walked to the feeder bus stops in the morning, people sit on their cell phones in the sun, winter time, the light shines, the robber comes, grab the phone and runs off. So suddenly something good, but because of the, of the change in the environmental and, uh, uh, um, status of the police station, it suddenly had an in influence towards crime. So it's important to be able to be on top of our game when it comes to the station uh, profile to know what is happening, what was there last year that is not here, and we need to keep our station profiles um, up um, on, on, on time and as current as possible because these things also have an influence on crime. Then in terms of the environmental assess assessment, I've mentioned earlier the hotspot analysis. I've just put in a uh, small example of how we do things. We will, for instance, in terms of the planning process, once we've looked at all these things, we've identified a specific geographical area in terms of the hotspot analysis that can helps us, that it helps us in terms of having the pictures. Is it, is it going down? Is it flashing? It's maybe too hot. <laughs> I 
<laughs> you must stand here. Sorry about that. Here we go. All right. Thanks, guys. Okay. So having all that information in terms of the various sources and the systems and all those things, it comes down to the actual planning process. We will then use our photos through our um, analysis that we do uh, the field work. And then we also have our, um, on the left-hand side, you will see the, the, the GIS mapping that assists us at the end of the day in in making use of, of um, a map overlay to, um, to help us to, to plot our crimes and that help us with, with, um, with our planning process. Um, you can, for instance, see here, we have indicated here in terms of the env environmental layout and the access, because sometimes if you have to go to specific um, premises and stuff, you need to have a sense of what's happening there, what, is, what can you expect there. So there's a lot of sometimes field work that goes into the planning process uh, at the end of the day to come to the execution. Then further to our products, some of these products that I've, that I've mentioned earlier manifest itself now into the actual information that we can have a look. So you'll find here as an, as, as an example, we'll have a crime analysis situation. We have the crime categories and the incidents in, spe in a specific hotspot as an example. You can see the hotspot that we've looked at here. There's a burglar residential. Um, you can see the previous year it was, um, oh, the, the blue one, sorry, is, is, is in the hotspot and you can see where the relationship between the hotspot and the station. So you can see most of the stations, uh, as we use the figures here, most of the 12 burglary businesses is happening in the actual hotspot. You can see business robbery, for instance, there was four, two of them happened in the actual hotspot. And so you can go through the theft of motor vehicle, common robberies, then you can see the relationship in terms of that. Then further, um, worked into a product that is important for us to understand. You will get to your problematic day of the week, which gives you an indication of which days, in this case, the, the example that I've put here, you can see Friday, there's 23 incidents of Friday. So almost with a normal business principle, you will understand that you have to deploy more people on a Friday than you employ people on a Sunday, in this case, in terms of the, uh, because Sunday is only one incident of a specific crime that might be happening. And that also then determines in terms of your planning process once you've done all these things through the analysis into that. Then the next step is then looking into your, we've now seen it is Saturday, now we need to go in what time on a Saturday? Because in terms of our resources, we are, do not have unlimited resources, so you need to be very clever how you deploy those resources to, to, to have a maximum in, in, impact on the crime with what you've got. Um, here, for instance, in terms of this um, scenario that we've got here in terms of the example, you will see that the spike of between 1400 and 1800 in the day is the hotspot. So common sense will tell you if you deploy between 14 and 1800 on a Saturday, you should be able to, 
to, to do something about the crime because you do not have enough resources to do it on a 24-hour basis because <clears throat> if you do not plan and use this process, if you have 50 people at the police station to do crime prevention and you take that 50 people and you spread them over a 24-hour period, you stretch them over, over a weekend. So you need to now be very, working very smartly. So you rather use 40 of the 50 people in those 10 or 12 hours um, that the crime is happening in that specific day and also on the specific time slots um, then, and using the other 10 maybe for the less, less crime, uh, crime um, areas. And then lastly, we also have, in terms of the top streets, now we're also zeroing it down because of the analysis that we've made through all the products that have developed. And we will come that street A and street B in that specific area on a Saturday and that time. So we're narrowing it down so that we know if you have to deploy, you deploy on a Saturday, you deploy between that time and you deploy in those and those streets or in this street block or in that specific street as, as an example to try and narrow it down because we do not have enough people to have all, all 50 people working seven days a week, all 24 hours, for instance, as an example. So that is why we work trying to work smarter. These are all theory, and sometimes we, we do this. The, the unfortunate thing is then what we call a, a displacement of crime because suddenly there's a pattern being formed by the criminal activity. We pick up the pattern through our analysis. Now we put a lot of em emphasis in street A and street B, and in two weeks' time you'll see about street, street uh, uh, D or street F is suddenly there's an increase, and then we have to follow again. So one of the things that we're also taking into consideration when we do plan is what we call an overflow strategy. We, we must anticipate that things might move from one area to another. So we cannot just keep the area clean at all. And that is sometimes where we rely a lot in our areas in terms of neighborhood watches, um, our private security companies, and our other role, uh, law enforcement agencies like Metro Police for us in, in, in Cape Town, the traffic and those people that assist us. And some stations are very much dependent on these um, uh, re extra external resources to make a success in what they are doing. Certain areas are a bit more dangerous, a bit more difficult, but in terms of certain areas, like for instance Cape Town Central, you've got a lot of um, external role players that plays a, 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 that helps the police here. For instance, the, 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 the cameras is a big role player. And those are all things that, that, that can assist us. Then just in terms, very shortly, in terms of mapping, I did touch on it when we did the environmental uh, analysis. We also have um, our crime, our GIS mapping system, where you will be able to see if you overlay it. It's very small. I'm not sure how you can see it. But for instance, you can see where the red men is lying or the little spots is where, for instance, there was murders in a specific precinct that also be able to give us an indication of where things are happening. And then we, will, we can also from that learn what is the proximity of that murder, for instance, towards a, a Shabin? What is the proximity of that murder in, in terms of a taxi rank or a specific street that people used to walk home? If, it is, if we are plotting robberies and you can see the robberies along a specific street where people are walking from the taxi rank towards the residential extension, so you, need, you, only, you not only get an, an uh, indication in terms of stats, and, and, and that, but also in terms of another layer, in terms of plotting crime. This is something that needs to, needs, still needs a lot of development in, in the South African police services. Uh, and I believe there's, there's a lot of room for improvement for us. Lots of the stations, because this is a very busy map that we have, lots of the stations make use of aerial photos where they still put, the, like in the old days, the stickers. But it's all ways and means at the end of the day of plotting. So you have another, almost another sphere of having a look at things because it's important. Sometimes you will find out, but there's a lot of dots in a specific area, then you have to understand why. Why is that area so much more prone for crime? And then you will find out, but it's, in the, it's close to a Shabin, or like I said, maybe close to a specific walkthrough or a footpath through a bushy area that the people are using funds that once they get from the, from the taxi rank towards the, the settlement or the area that they stay, um, to understand that dy dynamics in, in why certain areas are the way that they are. Ladies and gentlemen, that is in a very short nutshell in terms of what we do as the African police to, to, to analyze our crime and to try and plot it. And at the end of the day, to have a product that we can now hand over, once it's done at the station level, hand it over to, to the commander of the forces and say, Colonel or Captain, you have 50 people to your disposal. Here's the information. You have to now go and work out your duty roster. You have to work out your deployment plan. Then the normal things kick into place in terms of the broader planning process because the analysis part is the only part that we've discussed now. Then it goes over into that planning process because based on this, there's now planning done. And then it's the normal process of execution. After the execution, it's feedback. 
Then the monitoring and evaluation comes in in terms of uh, what have we learned, we, the crime has displaced, or this, or that, or that, and then we also need to, we start again in front with, uh, at the beginning with, again, there's crime happening in the new week or in the new month, month, we analyze again and we try and learn from where we've made mistakes or where things maybe went wrong, um, and that is just a continuous process. So thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Colonel. Um, so it is quite impressive. You can see that a lot of thought has been put into gathering data and using data to try and guide policing. And I think it uh, often raises one of the points about policing, that ultimately you can have all the information you desire, but it's about the actual planning and the capabilities and the resources of the actual police officers. You have to go out and do the very difficult work on the streets. And so too often, I think we tend to over-romanticize and we just get more technology, we'll somehow fix crime. Um, but that's not always the case. But thank you so much for this presentation. I think it does give us some insight into actually how advanced the think police service has uh, become in being able to set up systems to at least work with the data. But uh, I would li now like to call um, Senior Chief Superintendent, um, sorry, Chief Superintendent Bernard Edgar from the Bavarian State Police, who has had many years working um, on data systems, and uh, when we were visiting Bavaria earlier this year, found uh, the presentations from himself and his colleague incredibly useful and insightful, um, because after many years of trying to figure out how to get data and use it for policing in an effective way, um, made us realize that there aren't e simple, quick fixes to this, but I'm sure he's going to provide us with some very interesting and insightful presentations about the Bavarian experience. Without further ado, over to you. Well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a big pleasure for me to be here. Thanks for the ISS for the uh, invite, inviting me. First, I have to apologize. I can't speak as fast as my colleague from the subs because my brain has translated my thoughts. So it's slower and sometimes it even, it even doesn't work. Uh, analysis is a big topic, always has been for the police, but nowadays it's even a bigger topic because there is so much information out there. If you think about the net, if you think about, if you just think about a smartphone, everybody carries a smartphone. When you arrest somebody, we take his smartphone. It's not just in uh, older days when we looked in, in his book, what is his information, what is his addresses. It takes us a lot of effort, just this little smartphone, to get the information out of that. Since we have uh, half an hour, I just throw some thoughts into to think about, about uh, what's important about analysis. The agenda would be what we call intelligence-led policing, then predictive policing, very trendy thing, it sounds trendy, but it's something we always did, but in a, we do it in a different way now. Then I want to talk a little bit about identification, because at the end of the day, it's always we want to identify a person. If we know his phone number, if we know his face, his fingerprints, whatever, it's still not the person. We want to identify the person. And then at the end, we want to go a little bit uh, into the field, how we do this on the grassroots level, how does Peter's police station does this on a grassroots level. Why do we talk about intelligence-led policing? Because it cannot be a coincidence what we do. We do need, on different levels, we need intelligence-led policing. In the earlier days, people thought, well, especially police chiefs that thought, well, I know what's going on. Well, that's not the truth anymore. You have to have analysis to know really what's going on. Then predictive policing. If you just look in the past, it doesn't help you a lot because you want to prevent also crime. That's what we always did, but again, things are more complex nowadays. Data are more, so you have to have a proper yeah, uh, software, you have a proper environment, you have to have a proper idea to look in the future. And then again, identification is much more complex than it was earlier, I come to this. What are the preconditions for 
intelligence-led policing. Of course, we need the law. We have proper laws, your countries, our country have it. We need the right stuff. Already here, it starts, it's difficult to get the right stuff. Right. Because it's not just the police thinking, you need IT thinking, you need, you need uh, like a psychologist thinking, you need to think like a criminologist, so the right stuff is always the, the secret to be successful. Then of course you need the resources and then you need the analysis. You have all this information. Police is very, very good all over the world to collect information. Like in Germany, we, I'd say we put 99% of the money of everything, the effort, in collecting information, but then it, how we use it, that's a big, big difference. And we are still in Germany, I think we do some good things, but we are still at the beginning. And to say we are since 20 years at the beginning, <laughs> because it's not, not everybody, it's not by everybody accepted as much, that we need this, because again, people think they know what's out there, but it's not the thing. And then we need trust. Why do we need trust? What has trust to do with analysis? Analysis, analysis sounds so technical, no it's not. Analysis is, at the end of the day, it's the truth. And we as a police, we have to be very aware that everybody is very keen to get the truth out of our information on all different level, levels. And first of all, it must be the truth, so we have to have good analysis. On the other hand, we have to share it, this information with all the stakeholders who need it. On the, on, the different, on the different levels. And this has to be part of our philosophy, that we are not just like a technical police, a technical uh, analysis, it's about, it's, everything is about the truth. And this the philosophy inside the police has to be that we are there for the people, not for some stakeholders, because then I give you the information you want to hear, right? But that's not the point. It has to be the information which is the real situation. And, especially statistics, can very often be misused. If I just look, what do you want to hear? And then I give you this information, and what, what, what does the, the judge want to hear at the court? What does the politics want to hear? That's not the point. So we need to be trustful. We need to have the trust. And for that, to get this trust and gain this trust, we have to really uh, be good and uh, trustfully at analysis. Talking about intelligence-led policing, well, I call it the information is the natural resource for police work. If you build a car, you need steel. If you go at school, you need books. All we have is information. We have a lot of material information. I come back to that when it comes to identification. But all the other things is information, information, information. And as I said, it's too much information. If, if I want to know something about you, I can look in the net now and there's so much information and I have to, to, uh, to proceed it. So this is the thing now and all the different uh, things we need. We have one point is for example, if we have the information, if we uh, understand the information, it's not just for us, we have to find a way to provide it, especially to the court. If I, for example, have like a, uh, one year investigation and I, read, I, I write a report, 200 pages, that takes quite an effort for the, for the uh, judge or for the prosecutor to understand it. So if I put this in an uh, analyst notebook chart, he can understand it because he gets the picture. Those are all the things what we call intelligence-led policy because it shouldn't be a coincidence what we do and where we are and what somebody understands. If you don't understand what I did the last half year, it doesn't help and it makes the work useless. So we have the analysis and we have different level how we use it. We use it on strategic level, strategic analysis for decision makers, for politicians. And as I said earlier, we have to share the really two information, to share with everybody who needs it. Then we have the tactical analysis. analysis. We also share this, like with, uh, with the city hall, with other stakeholders, and we have the operational analysis. Of course, the operational analysis, analysis I don't share right away. I share this later with the court and with the public, but not, but not right away. And if I said earlier, information is a natural resource for policing, where do I gain this information? I always gain this information in the field. So it's the officer recognize crime or recognize any information. It's always this information. And then how do I process this information? This is 
the sequence, and that's, that's not the easy part. If you look here, we have the officers, then we have the Bavarian system, uh, the, the local system, then we have the Bavarian system, then we have the German system, uh, system, and at the end we have the Europol system. If the first information is wrong, all the systems don't work. So that's the point of everything. First information is the most important thing. And as we all know, officers don't like so much paperwork, they don't like so much put things in the database, so we have to make it easy for them to provide the right information easily into the database. So that's the secret of everything, to get the proper information from the first point and make it as easy as possible for the officers. And then we need, of course, crime analysis. We need a crime analysis unit, and for that we need specialists, not just IT, not, ju not just police, not just criminologists, we need a whole team who puts everything, everything together. And just to show it's not easy, this is uh, a chart. I, I don't want to explain this. Maybe I don't understand everything out of it. It's a technical thing, but just to show how difficult it is nowadays. But still, uh, we have to, to handle it somehow, and have, we have to start at one point, and we have to always start at the original information. I said earlier, situation reporting uh, make information understandable. This is an identity diagram chart. If you write, have to write, want to write down this, it takes you 20 pages. And if you read it the first time, you have to read it again. If I have a picture, you are able to understand it. The same thing to, put, to map everything. I know police maps everything right away. We understand this. With mapping, we are, we are pretty good. And it's very, very important to understand things fast. Cell site analysis. Put everything, like cells are everywhere, and we, we call it the uh, cell site information. So if there is a crime scene, there is a lot of information you don't see, because in that cell site there were a lot of people for using their phone. So what we always do when there is a murder or a big case, we go there and secure this information from this cell site even if we don't know yet if we need it or not. And then if we maybe two weeks later we, we have a, a suspect or something and he have his phone, we can look what's in his cell site. And also we can do analysis on that. For example, if you have a serial or something, you, you seize all the cell site information from different crime scenes and then you, then you match it and then you find one number was in this cell site, in this cell site, in this cell site. So this is a very important thing nowadays we use and we have to use. And of course, we talked about crime mapping. Already everybody uses this, but as easy as it is, as important it is. And now let's come to the trendy thing, predictive analysis. It's not, has nothing to do with miracle, it's nothing has to do with uh, working with the witch. Actually, it's something we always did. Every policeman, every police chief, every, everybody. You have, you have experience, and then you combine this with the thing you, you, you have, you, you, the situation right now, and then you combine this, and then think about what could happen tomorrow. That's, and that's the easiest thing. That's, uh, that's the secret behind predictive policing. But you have nowadays so much information that you can't handle in your brain anymore, or it takes too long. If I have like a hundred cases last night, and I want have uh, tried to bring this together with my experience, that takes two weeks, but two weeks are too long to, for the predictive policing. So we need some algorithms, some software to, to help us doing that process for us. But it's never an automatic thing. We, we, just don't, we don't just believe at the algorithm. We always have policemen in between who decide what we do with this information, what we get from, from the algorithm. We did have a big problem with uh, burglaries. It was really increasing, and as, as you all know, that something really affects society. If somebody goes in, it breaks into your house, and will really increase, and we tried everything, and so we really uh, got the option to uh, implement predictive policing. There are various, uh, various possibility of algorithm behind that. We, we use the near repeat. If there are criminologists, you are familiar with this. It's a, it's a research from the 80s and the 90s from the US and the UK that if there is a certain crime, it doesn't work with all kinds of crime, but if there is a certain crime, 
in a certain area, there's a good chance there will be the same crime again in the next couple of days. And this theory we put together with all the cases from the last, last five years of, of uh, burglary in Munich. And then we even we made it uh, more detailed for the situation in Munich for different offenses. And we, it's also nothing you can do it like all over the country, only on certain areas. We took out, out these areas and we simulated the software. And because if you have it in, in, in action, you don't know does it work or does it not work. Because if I have like a prediction there will be a burglary tomorrow, I can't sit down and wait, I, does my software work? So I have to do something. And then you don't know, well, was software right or, or why didn't it occur it because I was there as a police. So what we did, we did a simulation backwards because if, if I have the data from five years and I go in it with my prediction software and then I see was prediction right or not. And we have a, a, a weight of 80% which were right. We were right with the simulation. We put this in place in Munich. Uh, a little example how it works. We have the police database and again that is the most important, the most important thing to have the proper database because from at night in the morning at seven o'clock, we had the data from the last night, and then we have the, this is the, called precops, but it's the algorithm of the predictive policing. We put this together, and then we have a possible alert, if you look at the near repeat, and then we give this map, you see here, we give this map out to the police station, like Peter's, and it looks like this, because it has to be easy. If you make a report, five, five pages, the policemen have so many information when they start, he gets a map, and he sees this is the wet thing, this is the most dangerous for the next three days, out of our algorithm. The yellow is medium, and the green is pretty safe. That's what he gets, and then they decide with that what they know, what, do we, what do, are we doing with this information. It's fast information, they decide what they do with it, and well, not everybody, as I said earlier, not everybody believes in analysis, but people who have this thinking, and you provide this easy thing to them, like a map, not a big written thing, they, they like it, and well, we cannot prove exactly how it's working, because we always do something when we get that. And then, of course, if I predict it, and you are a policeman, you go there, they don't come. But that's our goal. So we have it now since four years, and I think it works pretty well. And then the, the third point I want to uh, stress here is Moore's identity. As I said, with all the information you have, at the end you want identity, uh, to identify somebody. Uh, you all know we have the fingerprint, we have the DNA. Everybody's working with this, with the fingerprint since 100 years, with DNA since 20 years, and now we have something new, what I call th uh, the third dimension of the record department of identification. It's the faces, I come to that. Okay, we have, a, we have a, a central database and we have a proper unit who works with the data, with the DNA data. Uh, just some examples, this is how, how you have to change your work in the field. This was a, a case I was working on uh, 20 years ago. That's how a crime scene looked without uh, working with DNA. That's how crime scene have to look nowadays. Nothing spectacular. Same thing with fingerprint. We, heard always since years and years and years, well, perpetrators know p fingerprints don't work anymore. They still do work. Everybody knows police use fingerprint, but not everybody used gloves. It still works, and also, 
Uh, for, this is an example. We have the drug parcels. We unpack the drug parcels. We, we seize and then very often inside, because it's, it's the, this rubber plastic, inside we find fingerprints and then we connect cases. Something completely new, if you think in a crime in the internet, you would think fingerprint had nothing to do with the internet. Since the pictures are always getting better and better and better, fingerprints in the internet we can use. And we had this idea three or four years ago. This was two years ago, the first, the first uh, child porn case. We could identify a perpetrator with his fingers. They hide their faces and everything, but they didn't hide their fingers yet. So we identify him. him. And if you are a little bit familiar with uh, the hate speeches and threat of uh, radicalization in the net, you know these guys maybe, with, they are threatening, like the, our Western society, they have their mask, but they sweat, do it like this. Uh, to be honest, we didn't succeed yet with this one, but we will work on that, and at one point I'm definitely sure we can uh, identify one of these guys by his fingerprints in the net. And then let's come to the face recognition, the last one, the new one. There are so many pictures out there, on the smartphone, and the internet, and the CCTVs everywhere. And we are not aware what we can do with these pictures everywhere. We can identify now people from one to one. You know this from the airports, one to one, that's easy. But what we can do now, we can go with one picture in the big database, 5.2 million uh, collected pictures from uh, convicted perpetrators, 5.2 million. And earlier we just could like well, look a little bit in the local, local pictures. Now we can look in the big, big database. It's not implemented perfectly in the Bavarian police. We, we work on that. We have right now a, a, a program that we can implant it. Because if I ask 100 policemen in Bavaria, do you know that? 67% don't know it, so it's a big uh, challenge to bring this within the police, but it's, it's the future for identification. It works like this, as I said, with a picture we can search in a database, and then you don't get the face one-to-one, -one. you need a specialist, you get all these proposals, you get like we, we You, you, get a, you get a proposal and then you have a specialist and then from this proposal you identify these guys. We had two years ago 50 cases resolved like this, last year 100, and this year we always have, always had, in, 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 in July we had 100 cases resolved just with this. We got, the, we got the picture and we identified the guy with this. And as I, I spoke earlier about trust. If the police is not up to date, if Somebody brings me his smartphone and that, that's the suspect. He stole something from me. And I say, well, mm, I don't know what to do. And they say, well, Facebook can do it, Google can do it, you can't. So this builds trust if you're up to date and you really are successful. And that's how it looks like, the one-to-one -one identification. And now we, we still do it one picture by one picture. But now everywhere, also in Germany, there will be more CCTVs private CCTVs or in the train or wherever. And now we just have a project where we try to, uh, to cluster faces out of this CCTV material. Because nowadays we have to look like if we have 100 hours uh, uh, taped videos, we have to look at it. With this new, with this new uh, software, we will be able to, to, to collect the just the faces to cluster them if somebody is more often on, on one video and then this will be again a big step forward about identification and the, at the end of the day of analysis. And now I hand over to Peter, he shows how he, and this is our thing, you saw the guy with the mask before, we want to have this guy, we want to see his face. And now Peter shows you how he does this on a grassroots level. Maybe try this.
connector for RME. Okay, sorry about the, uh, I think there's just uh, another issue that, is there a reason you can't use this? Okay. Do you want to? Um, Should we start up the version again? Yeah. Let's just see. Let's just go to. I think we need to do a setting thing. Well, okay. There we go. Okay, now we'll explain that uh, analysis is very important for the daily police work. So I'm a station commander in Munich, you see here in my office. Um, this uh, office is in the center of Munich. It's a very small concerning the area. It's a high, uh, it's, it's a high uh, density of citizens, but we are responsible for 70,000 people. And um, here is uh, some information about the crime, what happens per year in our responsibility. We have about 3,500 offenses. You see most of the problems are theft and uh, also damage to property and also violence, violence crime. How we deal and how we work daily. I will give you a short impression about the daily routine what we have. We start every morning at 8.45 with our group leaders in a briefing. And we talk about what happened the last 24 years. At top 44, not years, 24 hours. <laughs> so every officer uh, explained what happened in his responsibility, what happened, we discussed about this. And we try to find solution, we find where is it's necessary to policing, make more policing, for example, uh, where some uh, police is needed, we discussed if there's a problem, for example, a restaurant who, where we have uh, the last time violence crime, and um, the result of this briefing is we discussed where police is needed, what we have to do, and most of the time, officers said, oh, hmm, I remember there was a case and there's a connection to the other crime, and I'm not sure, but this is the experience, this, but it's not a guarantee. So, and therefore, we have an officer for crime analysis at every police station, and he has to check if this experience is true or not. We cannot live with the experience alone, we need more information. And this uh, officer for um, crime mapping, for crime analysis, he uses data from the national level, from the local level of the uh, police department, and he also uses data from ourselves, what happened in our office the last 24 hours. And based on this information, he made every day a crime report for our station. What happens the last 24 hours? And before we start, we make the briefing. This is the base, basic information for every briefing of our several groups in our station. Nothing new. It's not, um, I think, it's analysis, no. How we do that, it's in a lower way, lower art. The Office of uh, Crime Analysis he maps the crime. This is the first point what he does every day to see where crime happens. And we look and he looks if there's a connection to the several places. And then he looks if there is a special time where the crime happened. Is there a modus operandi in the several crimes? He maps the several crimes depending on burglaries, thefts, robberies on several maps and the philosophy is to see where is police needed. No police office in the world, I think not in South Africa, I'm sure, 
I see you agree with me, nor in Germany, in Bavaria, we no police station has enough officers. We need also, always more. The police, the, the station commanders ask always for more uh, employees. And therefore, it's very important to have a good crime analysis. And you see on this map, here this is a crime density map, where crime happened in my office. And this is, we have three points, three hotspots, and one important hotspot. This only an area about 500, no, I will say 1,000 1, meters. And when I bring the police office here into action, when we have here our eyes on this area, the officers from are more successful because they will find the offenders in this area. And it's not necessary to have police officers, for example, in the English garden. There is nothing. There is nothing crime. Maybe the subjective security feeling is sometimes not good because the people have the, the feeling, I'm not safe, there is no police. But if you see here this on this chart, you can see we, it's very effective for us in its economical way to bring police forces into action. And therefore, crime analysis is very important also on the level of a police station, not on the level. It, it is necessary for, for, the, for the headquarter and uh, for, for Bavaria, but we also have to use crime analysis on a lower um, uh, level at every police station. And then we are successful if we know. We cannot work with, when we not know what happens in our area. And this is another way. Bernhard explains just before, this is predictive policing. Somebody says, hmm, what helps? You have no guarantee. That's true, I have no guarantee that crime happened when he gave me the information that they have a near repeat report with a, with a high quality. But for me, it's very important because I know where police is necessary. And we can decide on the station level what we do. If I have enough staff, enough plain closed officers, I bring them into action. With their experience, with this information, we are much more successful because they know how looks the offender. For example, we get the information there are some gangs or some, some groups from uh, East Europe. Their behavior, how they look, what kind of cars they use. Additional with this information, we are much more successful. There's no guarantee that we will find the offender, but it's much better than to be at every place and wait uh, if we get the information that there was a burglary. We want to be first at the crime scene before the offender is there. And therefore, crime analysis is very important also at the police station level. Let me make a summary in what's the result of our presentation. Criminalizers is the basis for realistic reflection of the current situation and also for the crime trends. To be aware of the current crime situation and crime trends is the basis for targeted and professional police work. To be aware of the current crime situation and crime trends is crucial for political decision makers for enacting laws and provide needed resources. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much to our two chief superintendents from the Bavarian State Police for their insights into how the Bavarian police use information. And of course, ironically, while we're having a seminar on technology, our technology keeps on failing. Um, <laughs> Fortunately, we're just sitting here looking at presentations and not doing real hard work like policing and trying to get hold of offenders, otherwise we'd be in much more trouble. So uh, we have one last person to make a short input. This is Dr. Andrew Fall, who's uh, one of our leading South African experts on policing, in South, in, certainly in South Africa and in the Western Cape. Without further ado, I'd like to invite him to the panel to make a few comments. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking after these great presentations by uh, senior SAPS and Bavarian officials. I think many of us in the public and civil society often wonder about the alchemy that police do in the dark rooms uh, where, <laughs> out of sight. Um, and so it's great to get, get this new insight. I am going to give a very short input because this seminar is primarily about 
police, and I think most of us came to hear from police. Um, however, excuse me. Uh, you see, I've been stuck on a PC for so long, I've forgotten how to activate a, a Mac. Um, I think so small. There we go. Okay, great. So, many of you, like me, are from civil society organizations, members of the public. You're very invested in, in violence prevention and crime prevention. Um, but these magical figures that the SAPs, the SAPs hold onto um, are out of reach for many of us, and so often we are left guessing. And although I think many of you are aware of this, I want to try to make a brief, succinct argument, some of it repeating what we've heard, but um, making a case for broader sharing of data. So very briefly, I'm going to talk about why data is central to effective violence prevention. I'm focusing on violence because in South Africa it's our biggest challenge and there's good violence-focused evidence rather than crime in general. Touching a little bit on whether crime is predictable, talking about police as custodians, and then linking this very important police analysis to a whole of society approach to data, to, to violence prevention. What we might be able to do together if we had broader access. So we've heard both from the SAPs and the Bavarian State Police that police can't be everywhere at once, but they can be where they are needed most. The same is true for other providers. Um, anybody who's wanting to invest in violence prevention needs to focus their resources, but they need to know where those hotspots are. They don't necessarily need to know on a weekly basis, but anybody invested in violence prevention needs to have some sense of where they should target their intervention to make it most effective. We know, we've heard today, and we know from, from a significant amount of literature that crime is often focused in time and space. It's, it's committed by an, a small number of repeat offenders, and it's often associated to, with particular kinds of behavior. This all links into predictive policing crime analysis. South Africa has 1,144 police stations. I don't know if any have been built in the last year, but this, this, is, this is how many we had last year. Of these 1,144, just 30 of them account for 20% of murder in the country. That is crazy. 30 police stations with 4,124 murders. Uh, this was in the last financial year. This is based on data that came out today. Last year, um, I haven't had a look at the bigger data set from today, but based on data from last year, we also know that just 148 stations account for 50% of all murder. Murder is our best proxy for violence in general, so where there's a dead body, there are bound to be numerous other mutilated, injured, harmed bodies. If we look at violence, we can say this is where, sorry, if we look at murder, we can say this is where violence is happening. In terms of the Western Cape, just because we, most of us are based here, uh, in the Western Cape, just 10 of 150 stations account for 47% of murder in the province, and those 10 stations accounted for 8% of the national murder rate. That was last year. Um, based on today's data, those same 10 stations account for 9% of all murder in South Africa. So we've got, we know that violence is really focused in these the, this, this less than 1% of police stations in the Western Cape. 42% of the murder increase that we've seen since last year, so there were 1,320 new murders reported this year compared to last year. 42% of those can be attributed to just 30 police stations. Again, very focused. If murder and violence is so focused in 30 police stations, we should be able to do something to, to, we should be able to put a lid on that. We shouldn't be seeing a 42% increase based on just 30 stations. We also know violence, as indicated by murder, is predicted by time and place. According to the SAPS and analysis, most murder occurs over weekends and most of it is at night. If, we, if we've only got 50 cops and we want to deploy 40 of them, we need to deploy them over weekend evenings. The SAPS has also made a, a long-term consistent uh, link between alcohol consumption and both perpetration and victimization. So if, if one is 
has been drinking, one is more likely to, be, to, to offend or be a victim of a number of crimes, inclu including murder, attempted murder, domestic violence, and rape. So that's a behavior. So we've got places, times, um, behavior, and then certain types of people. We've got a small, small groups of people who often perpetrate uh, a significant number of crimes. This is a slightly different example, um, but particularly when it comes to robbery and then leading into organized crime, we often see people, uh, a small group of people um, perpetrating the bulk of the crimes. And um, some of you may have heard about the Gauteng aggravated robbery strategy that was pursued a few years ago, um, where a very small group of detectives targeted known offenders and in a very short period were able to significantly reduce aggravated robbery in Gauteng. The, the strategy ended and we've seen an increase. So we know that these various strategies work. It's just about using the data to implement them. So. To reduce violence, police should focus in South Africa on high murder precincts over weekends and evenings where alcohol is frequently consumed and unknown offenders, people who are at risk of offending um, or who have offended in the past. I'm briefly going to conclude by summarizing um, a meta review of um, violence prevention evidence, um, a meta review of thousands of, of research articles um, carried out by the United States aid agency. Now, they were, they were specifically saying, if you want to reduce violence in the Northern Triangle, which is Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, some of the most violent countries in the world, more violent than South Africa, if you want to be, if you're a donor agency and you want to invest in violence prevention here, what are the most, the best evidence-based ways to intervene? They say that police are very important, but they can't do it alone. What they said is interventions should be focused on specific problems. We can't simply say the police or civil society or social services will provide a general um, package. We need to focus on particular problems, um, for instance, domestic violence, for instance, gun violence. We need to identify high-risk individuals linked to those problems. Police need to signal to those individuals that we are watching you. We're not going to tolerate offencing, offences. But at the same time, there needs to be either from police or other, other services a legitimate uh, and genuine offer of assistance, a way out of that, that road to potential offending. There's no point in simply saying, we're going to punish you if you offend, because if, you don't have an, if, you, if you're on a, a path that is uh, leading you down that road, it might be difficult to get off without assistance. So it's about offering assistance, but, but flagging those individuals. Coordinating between partners and being flexible. It's about working in partnership. We all know this. The SAPS is very good at, at building partnerships. The Bavarian State Police emphasize partnerships. But it's about being able to respond to dynamics on the ground as they change um, in, in w over weeks and months. Um, and sometimes with bureaucracies and governments, this can be difficult. How, how do we get the go-ahead to shift resources from Camps Bay to Nyanga uh, is it going to take us weeks? We don't have weeks. Um, how are we going to communicate with school teachers in the school about our, our, our latest analysis? We need to change the way we're engaging with youth at the school. So things need to work quickly across partnerships. Interventions need to be guided by a theory of change that everybody buys into. A theory of change is a story about where we're going and how we're going to get there and what our roles are in getting there. So of course, police have an important role to play, but other services need to know their roles. And, and everybody must know that they're working in a team and, and believe that vision and know that they can, they can play their part towards it. And, and if they hit stumbling blocks, you, you revise the theory of change and you revise your roles. But it, it needs to be unified, again, to be unified we need sharing information. And, and the final comment from the USAID analysis is that everything needs to be based on analysis of problems, identified targets, um, evidence-based interventions, and a flow of information that allows for constant evaluation and revision, um, learning while doing, uh, and hopefully leading to less violence. So the SAPS data, the, this, this amazing data that the SAPS has is fundamental to reducing violence in South Africa. Regular sharing of data would build trust between the public. Um, 
whether 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 we as the public yeah it would definitely build trust police can't be everywhere neither can the rest of us none of us who want to reduce violence who want to reduce crime can spread ourselves everywhere we all need to be where we are most needed so effective violence prevention requires focused interventions based on partnerships guided by a shared vision and shared data and police crime analysis and police data is key to that thank you Okay, thanks very much, Andrew. It sounds quite straightforward and easy. What on earth can go wrong with that? Um, I would like to ask our panelists to come to the front. Uh, please, superintendents, can you sit in the front so that we can uh, just facilitate any questions or comments you might have. Uh, if anything that was said by any of the presenters raised some interest, you have some questions that you want more detail on, or you have any comments to make from your experience, I'll take batches of three questions. We'll get it back to the panel, and we'll just do it that way. I have a hand here, so you're one, you're two, and you're three. I'll hand over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Amy. I'm a councillor within the city of Cape Town, and I have a question for both our German colleagues and our resident colleagues. Um, both of you alluded to the fact that it's about the staff and the staff being able to enter the relevant data. So on both sides, how do you invest into training up your staff to be able to put in relevant data and to be able to analyze it? Thanks very much. And please uh, introduce yourself before you ask the question. Um, afternoon. Uh, my name is Bupa Fumba. I'm from the Right to Know Western Cape activist. So um, my first question will be based on the first speaker. I spoke about um, the geographic, geographical wara wara. So I want to know how in budget resources they locate in geographical because we seem that there's two, there's Cape Flats, there's township, there's middle class law. No. Through South African living here in the Western Cape, you find out, you know, in C point, there's more resource location in terms of human resource, police are sharp, sharp, they know their story. But if you go to care flats and township, the police, they don't know what they're doing. And they don't respond immediately on, on crime and they are taking place where we are. So in terms of the location of budget and resources, how do they do that? Um, one of the presentations referred to trust, and for me the, the, the important part of trust is are people reporting crime, because if your input data is skewed or incorrect, then your strategic um, allocation of resources is going to be incorrect, and unfortunately that's what we're seeing in South Africa, where in areas where there's very low trust of the police, precisely because there is a poor allocation of resources and people don't respond, the reports of crime are low and that's a vicious circle where um, because reports of crime are low, low resources get allocated. And we, we, we really need to get SAPS's head around to the idea that murder is really our, our best indicator um, because it's the only one that we can, we can trust. Okay, thanks so much for those questions. Um, could I hand it over to the panel? Um, I think probably most of those were <laughs> firstly directed at uh, our local police and then um, I'll get the comments from the, from the rest of the panel. Thanks, go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you very much um, for the questions. I think uh, very important questions. Um, the first one in terms of, of training of um, data capturers and so forth, um, I would, they, there's definitely, we make provision in our training um, curriculums and training provisions for, for this, but I personally think that they, they more can be done. It is sometimes so that in terms of data capturing, it is more the lower levels that is actually responsible for those the capturing of it, and us as on the higher levels use it. So there's obviously much room for improvement, and I think um, going forward and uh, listening to the Minister and the National Commission also today, um, there's a few lessons learned in terms of, of a lot of aspects, and I'm sure in terms of this, um, it is also important, and it, it actually links on to what the lady at the back there has mentioned in terms of the, the not reporting of crime also. Because unfortunately for SAPS, we also, we work mostly with what we get in. And it is so that one of the sources of getting uh, crime or information is by word of mouth. But our hardcore source is the reporting of crime. And I think uh, during the session this morning at the Portfolio Committee when the stats was announced, it was uh, said without any uh, hesitation that 
uh, murder is basically the, 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 a true reflection or the most true reflection of what is happening because people are not trusting for various reasons. However, from the South African police side, we place a lot of emphasis on trying to build trust and trying to um, ask people to come to the fore to, um, to report crime because it is, it is very important for us to have the real picture of what's happening. And this also then links into the question of one of the other people, the comments in terms of the capacitating and, and why, how is uh, almost like a, the resource allocation, if I can summarize it, is being done. One must understand that the, the, the crime situation is one of the things, and it, I think in terms of, of weight that it carries towards the allocation of staff throughout the, the African Police Service, um, it is obviously the one that carries the, the highest weight in terms of determining staff levels, but it's not the only thing. There's e things like uh, geographical size of the area that plays a role, the population plays a role, the number of population, the, number, the infrastructure of a specific area. You can understand that in policing camps by, uh, with proper streets and proper street lights and proper house numbers and policing an informal settlement of Enkanini in Kailicha and Sisson Tutu will know what I'm talking about, where there's no streets, there's sand paths, you have to park the van and you have to go in there. Those type of things also have to play a role. The socio-economical circumstances of the, of the environment or the environmental design of a specific area plays a role. But however, although there's a specific scientific formula in terms of putting all these factors in a pot and then comes up with a resource establishment of a specific precinct, um, the Kailicha Commission that most of you might be aware of that we had a couple of months back or last year or a year or so back, in terms of the, the issues that was happening in Kailicha um, has given uh, the a guide to the Provincial Commission in terms of some of the sections of the Police Act that he actually has the right and he has executed it in terms of given more resources than what the granted resources in terms of the scientific analysis is Kailicha must get X but he was he, can, he gave them Y because he can say because of this I'm taking away from some others one must understand that in terms of the staffing allocation of the Western Cape it is about nine, nine, 19,000 people and we are about 1,000 short of what we are supposed to have and we all know that supposed to have is, <laughs> is not, almost nothing. But the cake, the cake is just that big. So if you, sl if you cut the slice thicker for the Nyangas, you have to cut the slice thinner for camps base. And there's also obviously merits in all those things. But it is important to understand that crime is the biggest weight when it comes to, to, um, to determining staffing levels. And like I said, I think geographical uh, design of specific areas plays a lot of, a, a, a lot of um, a, a big role. So I think, uh, on, in my response, I think I've covered, I, I've covered it. If I'm not, I have not covered it specifically, you, make, make, you can ask a follow-up question. But I think it was the issue of the training of the data captures, the, restru the resourcing of stations, and also the trust and not reporting and, this, and so forth. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, would either one of you want to respond to any of those issues? From the German perspective, the training of data capturers is that a, yeah, a difficult thing to achieve? <laughs> and and yeah, maybe the trust issue as well, yeah. uh, how that affects uh, the crime data. This is a big issue also in Germany and a big challenge for us. Um, very important for every data analysis and for police is that we have a high quality on data. And therefore, we train our officers beginning when they start their career at the police school to store the data. And uh, this is a permanent process. Also at our station, we always look to that they store, that we have a high quality, and um, that needs many efforts concerning the training and clear instructions what to store and what we have to store, which way and which uh, information we bring into our database. So. This is the basis for every analysis that you have a good quality. And I know this is a problem everywhere to have a high quality and you have to train the young officers that they understand why data storing is so necessary for police work. Thanks very much. I think that is certainly a key challenge. Um, and one of the problems if you're just thinking of the person entering data, if they don't understand how it's being used and why there's value, then for them it's just sitting in front of a computer putting in numbers and it gets incredibly boring and doesn't have any meaning. So 
in some ways, we've got to have sort of feedback and explain, well, you know, it'd be great if you could say the data you, cap you captured on this case has helped us solve this murder. Um, so people realize that they're playing this critically important role. Otherwise, they're not going to be too concerned about getting it correct, and you won't have the quality you need. So thanks very much for that. Okay, I have a hand here, number one, number two, three, and then I'll take a fourth one. Well, I'll tell you what, and a fifth one. We'll see. Try and keep the uh, uh, statements short so we remember what the question is. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Just from the presentations alone, I didn't get a, a sense that the, the sort of information systems between South Africa and Germany are that much different. So I'd like to know from the South African police person, what is it that they've got that we don't? And from the Germans, what do you think we haven't got that you've got, first of all? Then secondly, in terms of, um, of data, you know, it's, uh, fighting crime and so on is obviously much more sophisticated. And as we get into preventative issues and so on, we need far more support from the state in terms of alternative data sources. So for example, we've got the Victims of Crime Survey. But yet, while we are trying to get local area sort of safety forums and things going, local area safety planning, we're not providing data at the local level. So should we not be putting pressure on the state as well to be basically decentralizing the victims of crime survey to a sub-provincial level so it can be used in very local level safety planning? Now, to the Germans, what, does, what other data does the state in Germany provide to support local level safety planning in addition to crime statistics? Thanks very much. Can I just have number two? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Wusesu from Kailicha. Um, with the German police uh, system uh, capturing data, I think if we, had, uh, we as South Africa take that uh, system and use it, it will advance um, uh, police stations like Camps Bay, uh, Seapoint and others that are already advanced in terms of the policing system. And then my question is, why uh, is it so difficult for the South African police services to work with the Department of Basic Education, especially the Western Cape Education Department, uh, where, we re where we require uh, and have a need for police visibility within our schools, police visiting our schools when there's vandalism, drug abuse, gangsters happening inside the schools? and burglary. And um, are police uh, getting constant or continuous training uh, for every year? And um, why is it so difficult that um, in 2017, uh, SAPS was about to build uh, 100,000 million police station in Musenberg, but they, they, they cannot build uh, a police station in Makaza, a police station in Nyanga, a police station in Samora where uh, crime is happening like it's in a high rate uh, where it's happening there. So here, this year in 2018, uh, the year is almost uh, on, 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 the, on the end, but the police stations that were promised to, to be built uh, are not built yet. So th those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question here. Um, afternoon, um, Nandi Pakanya from Mosaic. My question centers around sexual violence um, and is directed to um, the German gentleman. Um, in one of the, the slides, in I think it was the first presentation, there was, no, it was the second presentation, there was a slide where um, you know, it was shown in terms of the, the types of crime and the, 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 the most um, type of crime was, was theft and sexual violence, I think it was rape and coerced sex was towards the, 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 the end, I think it was the second least. So my question is, um, you know, in South Africa, there's high rates of sexual violence um, and in, you know, according to that, then it would present that um, in, in, in Munich, I think it was, there are very low levels of sexual violence. So my question is how or what strategies are they employing in mitigating and reducing um, sexual violence that we can maybe also employ in South Africa to, to reduce the high levels of, of sexual violence? Okay, thanks very much. I'll take the fourth question from back here. 
Um, thank you very much. My name is Sinisa Monagali. I'm from Kailich. Um, just to have a follow-up question on Spusisongos' question, the gentleman over there. Um, in Germany, I just want to check who's responsible for school safety in Germany. Um, because we are having quite a lot of problems here in South Africa, um, according for the people who are accountable for school safety in, 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 in South Africa. Because the Department of Education is saying it's not their role. It's, 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 the, it's the police role. Also, the police are saying the same thing. So everyone is like passing the bug to, to someone else in terms of school safety, theft in, in, in schools. So I just want to check in Germany who's responsible for the school safety. And sometimes it's useless to keep on mentioning his debts, in, but there are no implementations that are, doing, are, are happening um, forward because we found out that most of the crime is happening between 6 a.m. in the morning until half past nine according to the states, and other crime are happening from, um, five, from, from two to five. Those are the times that the high schools and primary schools learners are going to school and those are coming back from school. So those those robberies and all of that are happening during those times, but there are no there's no proper relationship happening between, between the Department of Education and also SEPs in, in this especially in this province. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. A very important issue about school safety and how that's managed in Germany, as we're not getting it right. And then I'll just take the fifth question here. Thank you. Khalib uh, Khalant from the Right to Know campaign. Um, much has been said about the um, three things. So the uh, intelligence-led policing, um, profiling, and then predictive policing. Um, and we focused generally on repeat offenders, so people who are criminals already. They're going to a 5.2 million database, for instance. I'm interested in the history, given the history of South Africa, to what extent this approach um, also applies to political violence. So there's criminal behavior, uh, murder, rape, all of those things, but the use of intelligence-led policing, profiling, and predictive policing to identify, for example, service delivery as on prov provocateurs, if you like, in terms of protest action, or um, the threat, the rising threat of um, radicalization and, and terrorism in, in Germany and the rest of Europe. So, so those aren't necessarily, yes, of course, they're crimes that are being committed, but these are ne not necessarily people who are already offenders, right? And so predicting what's the likelihood of someone being radicalized or leading a land invasion, for example. So to what extent are we using these mechanisms um, uh, to do that kind of policing. Okay. Thanks again for the very interesting and insightful questions. I'll hand over to the panel and uh, you can answer where you're able to. I'm not sure that all those questions are easy for you to answer, but uh, we can start with uh, we can start with you. Thank you. Colonel. Right. Uh, I think the first question was, what do we need? Uh, we need a lot. <laughs> um, I think if you look at the presentation of my, my colleagues in terms of, 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 of of certain of the resources that they have to their disposal. For instance, the new resources, and I know it's not only by them, but it's also quite far advanced in places like China, is for instance your faces, facial recognition. We do a lot of work with fingerprints and DNA recognition, um, and also ballistic evidence in terms of firearms. But I think that is something that we, uh, that is, that will, will come with the time, but obviously those software is, packages and stuff is extremely expensive. So um, I'm sure that our policy makers and our treasury and all those people that make the difficult decisions will obviously have thought of that. Uh, when it will be coming, unfortunately, I will not be able to say that, but I'm sure it will also come our way at, at, at some stage. Then there was the issue in terms of data. Now, it depends on what you mean by data, um, because by us in South Africa, currently there's, a, the, the, there's a, is the issue of, of, of um, making known crime stats, like you all know what happened today in Parliament. It is, a, it is a political decision that crime stats can only be released once a year, I think. They are moving towards releasing it maybe twice a year, but at this stage it is only done like that. So in terms of if you, if you want to talk about crime stats as data, then they will always be an issue by us in terms of the, the release thereof. However, in terms of other data, like for instance crime patterns and trends, that is readily available. People that is part of community policing forums, if they do not 
know by now when, what is happening, where things are happening, who we are looking for, then there's a problem in terms of the functioning and the trust relationship between the station commander and the CPF chairman or the CPF um, at large, because those things, crimes, patterns and trends, we are allowed to give. We cannot just tell you that there was 20,300 and some odd murders this year before it gets released. As from tomorrow, I will tell you there was 20,000. You most probably read it in the newspaper this afternoon. But now I can tell you that, but, and I can also tell you 2017, 16, 17, and 15, 18. But I cannot tell you how many, I'm not allowed to tell you how many murders has there been since the beginning of April this year until for the five months that we are in already. That I'm not allowed to do that. It's just the way that the cookie crumbles. So if you look at data, like I said, crime patterns and trends, those things are available. And there's lots of other data that's available. Data like how many police officers is at a police station. Data of how many vehicles is allocated to police station. There's, there's nothing to hide about that. That should be readily available in terms of, of assisting. I think um, the one gentleman talked about, the, uh, I'm not sure whether I've written it, uh, it, it or I think the word he, was, he used was the advanced police stations of, Krif, uh, of uh, Camps Bay and places like Nyanga and Kailicha. Now I, can, I'm, I'm, I am um, offering you an opportunity to, to make contact with me and I will take you to Kailicha Police Station and show you how advanced Kailicha Police Station is in in, term, in comparison with a police station like Camps Bay. I think there's a massive perception in terms of the advancement, if you call it the police station. There might be a very affluent community that is being served by that police station. Let me just give you an example. And I, please don't quote me on the figures, but I'm just talking generally now. Cra uh, Camps Bay is a captain police station, which left that station's police strength, I'm talking about the whole station, from the cleaner to the station commander. The chances of that being an excess of 60 people is very slim, but it's, it's less than 60. If you go to Kailitsa, it's an excess of 300 people. A difficult comparison to make because you're comparing apples with pears. But I can tell you now, if you go to, to Camps Bay Police Station, you might find one email at the police station. If you go to Kailitsa Station, you might you find 10 email addresses at the police station. So the perception of one police station in an affluent area being more advanced as a police station, that is definitely a perception, and I'm more than willing to, to, to show that to you in person. I think the issue is that because of affluent communities that people might get more involved, they've got money to pay for private security, is things that build that perception of a, an affluent police station. I can also tell you that the building of Kamsway Police Station is more needs more renovation, and, and Kailicha Police Station has got a brand new police station. Similar with Lente here and Mitchell's Plain, and so I can go along. Because all, a lot of money goes into that area. It just makes business sense. Whether we're successful or not, obviously it's a different, a different, different um, ball game altogether. But I think we just need to nip that in, where it needs to be nipped in terms of the if police stations being more advanced. Um, then in terms of... Um, the, the partnership between the police and the Department of Education, I think there's a, there is partnerships. We have a lot of programs in terms of police and getting involved in, in stuff, but I think there's still more to be done from a policing perspective, and it's very subjective, but I would, for instance, think that there should be compulsory subjects in terms of uh, in, this, in the school curriculum. But at this stage, because it's, it's different departments of government, I mean, if the principal does not want me to uh, allow me to have a 10-minute or a 15-minute session with his people at the assembly on a Monday morning, then he can tell me, no, he don't have time for me. And it's not, it's not compulsory for him to do that. Where I would, as a police officer, would want them to have it in their curriculum that at least X amount of time or a subject per week or per month is made available or, or, or time is being made available for the police to do these things. Because I think therein lies a lot of things. Um, we talk about uh, primary crime prevention and secondary crime prevention. Primary pre crime prevention starts at home, at the first place. Sometimes because it's not done there, they expect the school to do it. Now the school also failed, now they expect the police to do it. And the days are long gone where the auntie comes to the police and they say, my boy is naughty, I take off my belt and I give him six. Those days are, are long gone. But at the end of the day, I think there's a lot that needs to be done and it can be done still in terms of, of a partnership between the South African police and the Department of, 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 of Education. But once again, it is on that level that that, modus of, uh, that memorandum of understanding must be uh, signed or must be revitalized if it is in place, if it not. So I think that is, that is the important thing. 
Then the one gentleman talked about the priority of buildings of police stations. Unfortunately, <clears throat> in terms of the allocation of funding for police stations, etc., etc., that is a pro program that runs only at national level. Um, so, and funding in terms of police stations comes from the, the, the public works department. So, and in terms of even our province, we have we can only give input to say that if we have to pr prioritize a station in, in, in this province. Our priority number one, which is on the wish list, might only be priority number 10 national. So that's a difficult question to answer, so I cannot really tell you specifically why. All, all that I know is that in terms of that, it is something that we have at provincial level have very little to do with. And once again also, I know there was a successful um, 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 attempt uh, at the end of the day to have the funds reserved for the police station that was supposed to be built at that uh, area. But one must also understand that it is government buildings and you've all know, seen what happened in the news the last couple of days in terms of the fire. So obviously police buildings also need to be in, in, in shape in terms of um, their, their, their safety, etc., etc. So there might be reasons maybe one, one station is prioritized over another one. But I can tell you that, that the biggest police station in this province that is in these areas that we've mentioned, like your Kailicha, your Nyanga, your Mitchell's Plain, Lentegeer, are all very fairly new police stations with a lot of money being spent there. In terms of uh, the Makaza, I know, I'm not sure about Makaza at this stage, but I know the, the one in Veltevreden in, uh, in, in Brown's Farm, it is in an advanced stage, and very shortly they're starting with uh, also putting up um, some uh, um, uh, makeshift offices just to get that, that ball rolling in terms of uh, fast tracking that. That is definitely on a very high priority list as, as far as I can recall. Then uh, just the last question in terms of dealing with, with, with one of the things that has been uh, taking a lot of our time and energy in terms of resources, if you take the Hermanuses and the Grabos and the Outbase, uh, once, like you said, the, the, the type of crime that is committed there, if you look at it, a specific crime might be um, malicious damage to property, etc., etc., but it's, it's very high in, in terms of, of very resource hungry to deal with. In terms of, 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 of looking at, at, at dealing with it, we rely a lot on, on, um, on, on informal networks and infiltration into specific groupings that assist us in giving us early warning. In my presentation, you'll remember I talked about early warning so that we can plan for that. But sometimes it happens open night. You know, you, you you drive to the office in the morning on the N2. You hear that the N2 is blocked. Nobody, I mean, it was very close knit. Nobody got any information. But as you say, it might not be that the leaders there has been repeat offenders. They might be, their, their hands might be clean, but they still leaders. So one of the areas that we try and deal with that is through informal networks and through uh, um, infiltration into some of those areas to assist us in, in getting information to be, tr be proactive so that we can plan. Because if we know they're going to close the end to 2 o'clock tomorrow morning, I can tell you there will be people in place to try and not ha let it not happen. Thank you. I hope I've covered all the issues. Thanks. I think it's quite a response. Uh, to Chief Superintendent. Let me... Let me let me first come to the uh, question about predictive policing. Does it work? That's, ex that's exactly what we discussed the last. It reflects exactly what we discussed and what we have, the kind of discussion that we have in public about predictive policing. That's exactly the point. Uh, two things on that. First of all, we don't use, like we don't use any personal data. We just use case data. That's the first thing. Others you use personal data, we don't do that because exactly of this discussion, because I, I'd say like uh, Germany is one of the mothers of, of data protection, so if we would have started at the very beginning with personal data, we still would have it in place yet. So we started without personal data. Like if you look at it, if you're familiar with it, in the, state, in the States, they use so much personal data with it, it's like we wouldn't we wouldn't want to do that and we wouldn't be able to do that. They have like in Chicago, the 1500 most wanted, they get a weight and they, they predict when they will do something. And if they are on that street, it's like already they're following them and stuff like this. We don't, we don't do that. So we don't use the data, the personal data. And on the other hand, we don't use it like for this kind of crimes. We use it just for certain crimes, like for burglary. We, we are now in the plan, we use it for car theft and, and, and certain crimes. It's not like an overall, uh, system, we, we focus on everybody and on everything. This is very important because we had exactly this discussion. It's very, uh, very important to take it in place and not to make it something, you know, something people don't like because we have to, 
uh, with everything we do, we have to be, get public and we have to, again, to get the trust from the people. There is one thing we discussed, the result of the predictive policing. Do we give the result pu uh, to, the, to the public? Like every day, we decided not to do that because that would just create a fear and stuff like this. So, so we, we talk about the things we discuss and we do it very as sensitive as, as, as possible. But that's exactly the, the uh, discussion we did have and we, we do have. About your question, what, el what uh, kind of data we, we add to the data we have, well, I'd say we have like, we are the only one who have real, real lot of data about the crime situation because we collecting a lot and we are the one who share it with the others. It's not the other way around that we collect data from all the other institutes. It's the, if the institutes do a research, they ask us for data. Of course, we have the data from the courts and from, from the justice system. If we do researches, uh, we do have some universities that do a little bit of researches. It's again, not like in the UK or in, in the States. The, a lot of universities do researches on that. We don't have that. So really, 90% uh, of the data we do have. Uh, of course, but justice system, the NGOs, we use these data, but that's really the, 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 the smaller part of it. So the next question was, uh, why do we have less sexual crime rapes in our area of responsibility than in your area where you live? I don't know where it is. What can I say to this? I don't know the situation in South Africa. I can only say what we do to reduce sexual crime at Munich Police Headquarters and also at our station. So first point is that sexual crime is um, accepted as not accepted in the society, so they are very, it is immediately in the newspapers if we have a rape, for example, and um, the society, for the society is rape an absolute serious crime I think that's the same in, in, in uh, South Africa. But the consequence for us is that there's a high pressure for the police to solve these cases. And uh, we do very intensive investigations in that case. We have a special units for rape and sexual crimes. And we have you know, the broken windows philosophy is if, if you recognize a type of crime very early, you can intervene. If you wait too long or you have a situation where you have got, which with a high amount of crime cases, we have not the stuff and the, um, the, the budget and not the, the personal stuff to solve so many cases. So the advantage for us is that we have less crime and we intervene very early with a high intensive investigations. And we do also a lot to make understandable that sexual crime is not acceptable. So we start, that's the next question, what we do in schools, we start in schools to explain the children, to explain the school girls and boys um, what they can do to avoid crime, especially also to awareness training. And um, we make also clear that sexual crimes are not acceptable. This is a long way um, to do that. So I don't know, I have no solution for you. I can only say what we do and for us it's a very important point. Then the next question was about school security. So we're very happy in Bavaria and in Munich that we have uh, this one point uh, in every police station youth officers. And uh, these youth officers are permanent in contact with the schools. So we have uh, early information if there's something happens. Robberies, thefts, for example, sometimes also sexual crimes. And they are accepted from the teachers, from the school, but they're also accepted from the, from, the, from the school boys and girls. So what we said before, trust building is very important and uh, they are in plain clothes at the schools and if there is some problem, they intervene. 
before there is a crime. And if that not helped, for example, we have a robbery, we will see it in our daily briefing, we will see it in our, uh, when we analyze the area, so we can, similar like the sexual crime, broken windows full of CVP, react very early. And at the moment we don't have a problem depending on the, I think they are concerning theft and robberies. It's, it's, it's easy to understand. We have, uh, I will say, full employment at the moment in the area where I'm responsible for. Though this is a very um, area with high income. So theft and robbery is not um, so important. You have to see what, what citizens do you have, where you're responsible for, and I think that there's also an influence on the individual police station and the, the statistics. It's only the statistic from my police station. We have 25 police stations in Munich. So it's different, not always, in everywhere the same, but I can only talk about my station. But very important is for me to react very early and have the possibility, the, the personal stuff, and if you have only a few crime cases, you can react if you have too much it's, uh, it's a challenge. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, Andrew, do you want to say anything else? I think also one of the things that impressed me about uh, Bavarian policing is how there are different police officers trained to work with different targeted groups, children, young adults, teenagers, and the elderly. Um, and those are people who want to work with those targeted groups. They are police officers, but they won't necessarily wear uniforms and spend a lot of time Basically, that's their job, is going out and engaging with the different focus group groups to see what their concerns about. And of course, you know, the young adults, particularly young males, would be a particularly uh, vulnerable group who are more open to maybe using violence or committing crime. But these police officers are there to, to uh, answer questions, to find out what kind of support they might need, to make it clear that they are, there is a relationship if they have any information or if they need help. Um, and so that's something I thought was quite a useful uh, way of engaging with the, police, uh, with the communities. I think we, we too much expect all our police officers to be able to engage with children, teenagers, young adults, and the elderly. And in fact, those are different, very, very different groups that have different ways of, of engagement and have different needs. And, uh, and um, I think that sort of more segmented target approach is probably something that we could also consider in South Africa. We've come to the end of the seminar. I want to really uh, extend an incredible thank you and much gratitude to all the speakers here today. Um, Colonel Fosler from the South African Police Service, it's always good to, to get somebody from the police to come out and speak, and I think you really gave us a lot of insights into the South African Police Service, so thank you so much. To our um, German colleagues from the Bavarian State Police, uh, Bernard Egger um, and uh, uh, Breitner, Chief Superintendent Breitner, Thank you so much, Peter Breder, for your contribution. Uh, it was great. Uh, you were really great hosts when we were in Bavaria, and I hope you've been able to respond in kind in South Africa. To my colleague, Dr. Andrew Fall, for his inputs and his support to the work that we do. And of course, importantly, to our funders, the Hans Seidel Foundation, uh, really fund a lot of the work that we do are a very uh, valuable partner to us and have funded a lot of work in South Africa trying to improve public safety. And um, to the people who run this conference center, and of course, importantly to all of you who came out today uh, to listen to the presentations, to ask questions. I hope you found this valuable. Please do register on our website if you want to be up to date with more of our future seminars. Um, most of them are, are in Pretoria, but we do live stream them from Pretoria, so you're able to access them from anywhere in the world. And um, if you feel like you'd like to engage further, please do. There's some publications at the back there. Uh, please feel free to take them. And we look forward to seeing you at future events. And please keep safe. Thank you. And at quarter past four, we're doing a crime briefing if you're interested in attending that. <laughs> <laughs>